All right, it is uh, DJ Shockley on the Georgia Show today. DJ, keeping it busy on the sidelines for the Georgia Bulldog Radio Network and for Fox 5 Atlanta, WAGA, the old uh, sports anchor in the ATL. What's up, man? How are you balancing it all? I'm fascinated with your work-life balance. Yeah, man, it's cool, though, man. I I tell you, um, when I first took this on a year ago, I asked myself the same question. (laughs) <laughs> How was I going to balance it? Because right now it's seven days a week. You know, I do uh, this, this, the anchoring stuff Monday through Thursday, travel with the dogs Friday, games Saturday, and then I'm at the Bends on Sunday or, you know, doing the Falcons on Sunday. So uh, I found a way to, to keep that balance uh, going, and uh, it's been fun, man. I got a chance to do a lot of different stuff this past year and look forward to doing it again this year. So uh, it's a fun challenge, man, and, I mean – how tough is it? How tough is it really? I mean, I'm covering sports all the time. So, I mean, can't be too bad. Sports are fun, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm all in on the dogs right now myself. But I remember having the opportunity to cover the Braves and the Falcons and Atlanta United and Georgia and occasionally uh, that other school in Atlanta, too. Uh, but I know you as an Atlanta guy, I mean, that that has to keep it interesting, keep it fresh for you. Uh, that's a that's a win win, I guess. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, when you're in your hometown and you get to you know be a part of something like that and cover the hometown team, the team that you grew up watching, uh, it's definitely cool. Uh, I tell you, you know, just have an opportunity to meet a lot of these guys now uh, that play for the Braves, or you know, meet some of the the newer guys that play for the Falcons, or even find out much about Atlanta United. I knew nothing about soccer before I started. Now. I know I can't call it a field. It's got to be a pitch, you know. I mean, all these different things that I'm I'm learning now. I got to cover the World Series last year. I was in Houston, literally standing on the field, talking to to the Pearls man himself, Jock, and talking to Dansby and you know Freddie. I mean, it was it's pretty cool from a guy who's you know grew up in this area to now be able to cover those same teams. I mean, you're spoiled. You show up. The Braves win a championship and the Dogs win a Natty. I know. Good man. luck. It's crazy. Good luck. Coincidentally, uh, let's man, talk. Rolled in at the right time. Uh, let's talk about the dogs. Obviously, they're getting all the hype right now. Kirby can call it a distraction. Everyone else can call it rat poison. I'm all in on the fans need to enjoy it, regardless of you know how distracting it may be for the team. This is a new stratosphere for Georgia Shock, and from your perspective, being on the field and covering the program. What's it like to be a Georgia Bulldog right now inside of the locker room, inside of Georgia's facility? It's pretty cool because now, as much as, you know, Kirby says, you know, we won't be hunted here in Georgia for the first time in a long time, Georgia is the team. Georgia is the team that everybody's looking at. And now you look around the country and everybody's saying it's Georgia and then Alabama. It's Georgia, then Ohio State, it's Georgia, then everybody else. And think about it, for the last 40 years, Georgia's been chasing somebody. We've always been the team that's always been the team that's, you know, trying to figure out how to get over that mountaintop. And you finally do it last year, and then now you start the season, you're 3-0, and and you look dominant in all three ball games. And now everybody talks about, okay, well, there's no way they can be as good as that team last year. That defense was once in a lifetime. And now you look up and, you know, hey, your top 15 again on defense – uh, you know, they're doing all the right things on offense. That's and a lot of people are talking about, hey, let's get this guy in the Heisman conversation. I mean, the, the story is awesome. And then you kind of look at this entire team. And from the inside, you look at it, you say, man, they got some dudes right here. They got a lot of young talent. They got a lot of guys who can play. And you say, where are the, the glaring weaknesses? And it's hard to find one. And every time you talk to somebody, they want to say, you know, hey, is there a weakness? And it's hard to find one. But now it's all about – is this team better than last year's team? That's the only conversation that you can have now about the dogs is, is this team better than last year? Uh, and who's going to be a guy that emerges as the guy this year? Yeah, and for me, I'm curious, which team is going to give Georgia a game? I, I mean, Oregon appears to be better than the 49-7 uh, <laughs> final at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Uh, or not, no, what was it? 49-3? Yeah, 49-3. 49-3 and then 48-7 against South Carolina. Uh, but South Carolina obviously overmatched. Samford obviously overmatched. 
I mean, we might wait until the Tennessee game or Kentucky game because if Florida doesn't get its act together, I don't see the Gators giving Georgia much of a contest right now either. I mean, the schedule's setting up pretty nice. It's just, as a Georgia fan, I think it's easy for people to sit there and be like, man, when's the other shoe going to drop? But this team's really good. Um, Obviously, we'll get to the offense. That's your forte. But you brought up the defense and losing all that talent and seeing how good they are right now. Do you think it's a byproduct of the competition they've played? Do you expect them to be tested at some point? Kirby mentioned it yesterday. He kind of mentioned that with the leads that the offense is building, it makes other offenses play differently, and it makes things easier for the defense. I mean, how how much do you expect Georgia's defense to potentially still be tested at some point this year? I think what you said is true. I think what Kirby mentioned is very true. Obviously, when you're playing with a – you know, three, four score lead or, you know, you got a team chasing from behind. Teams change up their offensive, you know, game plan for sure because you don't want to get behind even more. So maybe at times you're, you know, not as, uh, I want to say, uh, versatile as far as what you want to do offensively. And your defense can play more vanilla. You can play more younger guys. You can put guys in positions that can win. And, you know, everybody's, you know, in that chase mode on the other side. Uh, But I think – there will be a time this year where this defense will be challenged. I think we go back to last year and we think about that first, you know, couple series on the road in Tennessee. And it was the first time that off that defense had seen that up-tempo, go fast, and Tennessee went right down the field. And then they adjusted. They made the right adjustments in-game and, you know, kind of took it over. I think that's going to be a similar stance this year once you play a team maybe like Mississippi State that likes to go fast and like to throw it 40, 50 times. you got a quarterback who won't be afraid of that Georgia defense to throw it around and can make some plays. Um, Tennessee the same way. I mean, Hennon Hooker is a, a year removed from that game. He was in it. He knows exactly what it's about, so I think he will play better. Um, their offense in year two under Hypo will be better. So I think that will be an interesting test for this young defense um, in that ball game. I, like you said, Richardson at Florida, if he could find a way to play the way he played against Utah, he absolutely can be somebody that gives Georgia some issues on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, so it's going to be fun to see these teams get out and have a chance to, you know, go against the Georgia defense. And you're hoping that it becomes a competitive game. I had the question the other day, somebody asked me, would you want a dominating team or a competitive team? And for me on the sideline, I wanted to be more competitive. There's more to talk about when the game's close and you got something to actually talk about. When it's dominating, it's over by halftime, and everybody wants the clock to keep running. So uh, hopefully in these next few games, uh, this Georgia defense does get tested because down the road as the season gets on and you get into, you know, maybe the SC Championship game or, you know, the playoffs, you're going to be tested. Uh, there are going to be teams like Ohio State and C.J. Stroud who – won't care about your defense and what you've done and want to put up big numbers. Uh, as we know, Alabama believes they still uh, can beat you. They did it in the SC Championship game. They feel like they let one go in the National Championship game. So it will be interesting to see if they can find a challenge down the road. And I ultimately believe they will need that uh, for a lot of things, for correcting and getting guys in the right spots. What's the difference in Stetson Bennett this season and Stetson Bennett in 2021? Just a confidence factor. I think understanding that he is now the guy. I think since he's been in Georgia, he has never known that he was the guy. And even last year, Kirby talked about him being the guy late in the season. But I still think there were times where we heard the chatter of people wanting JT to come back in. There were times where maybe he didn't play his best, and he still kind of looked over his shoulder. And, you know, he won't ever say it out loud in the media but when you know that somebody could possibly come in and take your spot or could be coming in for you, you think differently. But I think having an opportunity to play at spring ball and be the guy. Going to offseason and be the guy. Going to training camp and be the guy. And now the clear-cut leader of this offense and his team, uh, I think that goes a very long way for any quarterback knowing that you have complete and utter control of this offense and you don't have to worry about if you throw a pick or you play a bad quarter that you're going to be coming out of the ball game. So confidence is everything at that position. And I think Stetson understands that he is that man now. And this team goes as he goes, to be honest. I listen to you guys. I don't know if you can see. I got a, got my radio back here because you guys, old school. <sighs> oh, yeah. But oh, yeah. you guys are way more current than the stream. The stream's delayed by like a minute, it feels like. So I like to listen to you guys. And I heard you 
make an observation about Carson Beck uh, at South Carolina. A funny story. You were talking to him about what you wanted to see from him when he got in the game. You wanted to see him show off his wheels a little bit like Stett did. Uh, and and he got the chance to do it. But he kind of he kind of uh, gave you a smoke screen. What <laughs> happened down there? So – before he goes in, this is after Stetson, you know, walks in the end zone on that touchdown, shakes the guy at the line of scrimmage and kind of, you know, walks in the end zone and shows off his wheels. And Stetson, I mean, and Carson's about to go in the game, and he has the first series, and he goes down, and I think he throws the Oscar, and, you know, they get the touchdown and all that kind of stuff. So the next series, he comes back, and I'm like, yo, when are you going to show me your wheels? When are you going to show me, like, you know, I seen Stetson run, what's up? And he looks at me and goes, nah, I'd rather just throw it. I'm not really, you know, I don't really want to run it. And then the next play, he comes out and goes for 19 yards. I'm like, <laughs> dude, you've been sitting there on a run. So then he comes to the sideline. I didn't say this on the call. He comes to the sideline and he says, I said, bro, you lied to me. You lied to me. And he was like, yo, they called it. I had to run it. So it opened up and I just took off. So I, I gave him a little grief about that one. And the other play, uh, I'm about to. 10, five yard line. He tried to shake a guy. It was like slow motion. And he was like, yeah, yeah. See, that's why I just like to throw it. I don't like to run it. So it was a. Stet's got was, more of the side to side motion than uh, Carson does, but he did pick up a big gain there. Um, so Munkins got things cooking, to say the least. I am more interested in, and I think you have the perspective here of how Mike Bobo is also fitting into this offense. Do you see anything in this offense that's like the thumbprints of Mike Bobo, or do you have any insight into how his role as an analyst with what Todd Munkin wants to do is working right now? Well, let's, you know, let's, let's leave no doubt. This is Todd Munkin's offense. This is him through and through. Um, obviously, you can see the communication because uh, Bobo's on the field. You see him in – in the locker room, there's constant communication he has with Monk and he has with, you know, Searles, the offensive line coach. He talks to – he has a communication with everybody on what he sees. So there's definitely something that he's giving to the offensive side of the ball. But uh, from what I hear and what I know, Monk, and he has complete control. I mean, he, he has everybody on the headset and he's talking to guys. But at the end of the day, this guy can remember stuff that happened – three, four series ago. He remembers, you know, coverages that they were in when they ran a certain formation or they ran a certain play. This guy is smart as all get out. So, yeah, he loves the input of his other coaches and even Coach Bobo, but at the end of the day, this is all Todd Monk and, and what he likes to do. He's calling a well of a game uh, the last three games, and he's continued to do that even last year in the playoffs. You can see what he can do uh, when, he, when he dials it up. So he, he definitely – has a good feel of how to get all these talented players on offense the ball and try to keep them all happy. Yeah, there's there's so many of them, man. I mean, AD is out last week. They probably don't need them this week. Might not need them at Missouri, if we're being honest. Just get them healthy. Uh, same thing with Jalen Carter. Last one for you. Speaking of Bobo, I mean, I know he was your guy when you played at Georgia offensively, along with Coach Rick, obviously, but – Kirby's mentioned how much this staff is like the ultimate staff that he could have ever wanted to put together. And incidentally, it has a lot of Georgia guys. Can you speak to what the cohesiveness of all those guys, Muschamp, uh, BMAC, Todd yeah. Hartley, all these guys that know what Georgia's about, how much does that influence the success that the dogs are having? Tons. I think it's probably the number one thing that makes them ultra successful is or first, how good of a guy they are, how good of a men they are, how much they care about their players. And I think ultimately the passion that they bring every day. I mean, you're talking about guys who are so passionate about their players, so passionate about these guys doing great. It's fun to watch. And to have that kind of group match the same kind of intensity that you can see that Kirby has on game day, I know he loves because he is a passionate guy, as we all know. And all these guys bring it in their own particular way. They all get after their guys, but they also love on their guys to make sure that those guys go out and play their best. So having the collection of coaches that they have, they have different personalities, but they all have one goal, which is winning and making sure their guys, their positions are playing to maximum level is what it's all about. And those guys continue to do that week in and week out. And not to mention, 
They're all dogs in recruiting. They all get after it. They all, you know, want to bring in the best. And uh, I'll tell you, I think there's a little friendly competition between all of them, and it makes it good because they all want this program to be the best it can be because of what they know it is about. It all starts from the top, and Kirby Smart is not resting. He is going overboard on Kent State this week on just – Getting the guys prepared and not letting them mentally check out, it is very evident. Shock, uh, appreciate your time. Everybody catch him on the sidelines. Tune into your radio. Listen to the dogs wherever you are around the southeast. And catch him on your TV on Fox 5 and that sportscast. Thanks, DJ. Well, I appreciate you, bro.